Hello everyone, thanks for coming outside with me today. Today I wanna to cover the topic of tuning myths and really specifically because I've been getting a lot of messages which is awesome, I'm so glad that so many people are contacting me with their tuning questions and their archery questions in general, bow hunting questions too. If you got them, I'll take whatever, Facebook, Instagram, email, so on and so forth, Average Jack Archer, AverageJackArcher at gmail.com. But when I tackle today five really prevalent tuning myths that are going on right now, it's beginning of June, people are starting to buy new bows or maybe they're getting new strings on their old bows and they kind of are starting the tuning process over from scratch. And I want to address some of the biggies that I've been coming across of and I've been butting heads with for years. So without further ado, let's get started. Tuning with number one, center shot. Never in the history of owner's manuals has any manufacturer told you to line up the center of the cam with the center of the string, the center of the grip or whatever to line line up your center shot. That is absolute malarkey. I don't know why. I don't know where it started. Every manufacturer I've ever seen says 13 16 from the burger button of the riser. So the Elite Cure is an excellent example of the burger hole here. It actually has two of them. You would mount your rest, of course, on the backside. But on the inside here, taking a tape measure and measuring 13 16 of an inch from here out. 13 16 of an inch from that point to the center of your arrow as it's knocked into the rest on your bow. That is the starting point. I've never seen a bow manufacturer recommend anything else. And if they don't recommend anything, 13 16 from the riser is an excellent place to start. I see so many people just absolutely pulling their hair out. Their, their arrow doesn't line up perfectly with their stabilizer. It doesn't line up perfectly with the cams. And actually, the cam's the bigger issue. But stabilizer mounts and stabilizer bushings, they're just drilled and tapped. They, don't, they aren't a uh, particular part of the bow that could be drilled and tapped perfectly. And a lot of stabilizers aren't perfectly flush on the back end either. And so sometimes it will be just canted off. Most of the time it's not though. Most of the time it is going to be flush. But leveling it off with the stabilizer as you look down, you know, you knock an arrow and you look down, you see it's not sitting perfectly level with your stabilizer. That's never been a tuning method of ever <laughs> with any bow manufacturer that I've ever seen. Some older bows, like the older Hoyt's actually the stabilizer bushing is offset on the side of the riser. It's actually meant to be over there to offset all of the weight with those lightweight carbon risers if you once you've bolted on your rest and your sight. So going with the stabilizer down the middle is just malarkey, get over it. Same thing's true with the cam system. If we actually take a peek here at this Elite Energy cam, we can see that it is not actually lined up in the center of the V of the limb cut. You'll see actually that the outside edge here, or excuse me, the inside edge rather of the cam is actually in the center and the string track actually sits off to the side. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So if you go to line up your arrow straight down the limb, straight down the riser, straight down the grip, it's not going to be right because more often than not with most cams today, they're not set up in the exact center of the limb. A lot more becoming more commonly set up in the exact center of the limb. But if you have an older bow, you know, 2016, 2015, 2014 and older, it's a very good chance that just like this Energy 35, that the cam is actually offset inside, whether it's a solid limb or a split limb bow, it's quite often offset shimmed over and the string track sits proud to the outside of the riser which means that 13 16 of an inch becomes even more paramount myth number two that's becoming really prevalent more and more in the past few years is people really trying to focus in on their arrows the spine of their arrows the dynamic spine of their arrows how they're tracking in flight so on and so forth and they're forgetting to understand how their bow works if you have a local shop in your area and has a good bow technician it's a pretty good shot that he or she knows how six, seven, eight different camp styles or more if they've been around long enough know exactly how they work with their yokes if they have them floating yokes, fixed no, uh, yokes, binary cam system, single cam systems and all the little ins and outs and intricacies that all those different bow styles have to offer from every different manufacturer. That is the important thing for you to figure out and jot down, write down and memorize first. For example, I'll keep using my Energy 35 here. My Energy 35 is really really picky on the axle to axle length. 34 and 3 quarter inch is the manufacturer's spec and I've found for every 16th of an inch over, so if it comes in at 34 and 3 quarter plus a 16th axle to axle, I lose 2 to 3 pounds of peak draw weight. 
Now that's not every energy 35, but that's my particular energy 35. So if I don't have that uh, axle to axle length and brace height dead nuts on, I'm losing that poundage and I'm losing efficiency. And a 16th of an inch with how much uh, your string and cable can stretch, that's nothing in string and cable stretch land. That little bit of movement, two to three pounds of peak weight, now your aero flight is garbage and your tuning is totally different. It's so, so important for you to understand the intricacies of your bow, your can system and style, and really figuring out how that works long before you start trying to figure out the optimal spine dynamic and all this nonsense. I wanna backtrack, it's not nonsense. Understanding aero flight and dynamic spine and all this sort of stuff is definitely incredibly important, but it's only half the equation. Remember, this is the thing with all the giant moving parts that actually shoot the arrow down range. Understanding this first is more important first than understanding your arrow. And real quick, I can hear naysayers already, well, the arrow is the thing that hits the target or does the killing in the whitetail woods. And you're 1000% correct. There's no denying that. But when I go to get my car inspected, the mechanic checks out the brakes and the tires and all the other giant moving parts that are really important. And the thing that keeps me alive, the seat belt, they never check once. So again, Moving parts, a lot of intricacies, string, cable lengths, axle to axle, brace height, draw cycle, blah, blah, blah. It's very important. Big tuning myth number three, and this one gets stomped out if you go into forums and on Facebook groups and that sort of stuff, but the shop already tuned my bow. No, the shop put the bow in spec for you. They can pull out a piece of paper and actually some bow companies, uh, I believe Obsession was the latest to do it, will shoot a bull hole through paper at the factory. That's all well and good for whoever that guy was or gal was that shot that bullet hole. But for you, each and every bow setup and each and every shooter is different with that bow setup. You're the one that has to tune it. I know if you bring me a bow into the shop, either here in my basement shop or at the shop I work at downtown, if you bring me a bow, I'm going to put it into spec. So again, 13, 16 is from the riser. Cams are going to be in time. Your knocking points going to be in the right place. Going to put the peep in the right location for you. Make sure your draw length and peak weight are what you want, so on and so forth. But when it comes to actually tuning it, because you're the one holding it and you're the one doing all the shooting, that's where it has to be. Your shop can go shoot bullet holes all they want. It's your bow, it's your setup, you have to tune it to you. So reason number four, which has come around in the past one to three years predominantly, but it's a big problem that a lot of people have been messaging me about recently, and that is finding the exact knocking point where your D-loop's gonna go on your string by measuring off the cams or the axle to axle length. Again, going back to number one, this is something I've never seen a manufacturer actually recommend in any manual or talk to any rep that I've ever heard from. They've never said, yeah, measure off of the bottom here of the top cam and measure off the top here of the bottom cam, find that distance, split the distance, and that's where your D-loop goes. I've never heard such a thing. And that's actually why I have this rubber band here. So this Energy 35 is a prime case and example for such a uh, method. The top cam and the bottom cam are exactly the same. So the bottom cam and the top cam both have this hump here that's on the uh, leading edge or coming into the riser here. So I took a tape measure and measured from this point here to the other peak over here and I got 30 inches dead nuts. So took 15 inches, which is right in the middle, and then I stuck this rubber band here at that 15 inch mark, which you see is nowhere near the knocking point. Your knocking point should be established in a 90 degree angle from, again, that burger buttonhole, 90 degrees back to the string. If you have a single cam bow, you can actually get away with being maybe like an eighth of an inch higher. This actually could be an eighth of an inch higher here where my D-loop currently is. But notice here where this rubber band is. Look how low that is. And actually most of the people that have been messaging me have said, yeah, I've tried the uh, measuring off the cams or measuring off the axles, because that's also a good fixed point. Doing that uh, half you know, cut it in half and see what happens, and I'm getting a really low tear. Well, of course you are, because your knocking point is incredibly low. Look how much lower that is. It almost is touching the shelf. So it's no wonder that they're going to get a knock low tear. So in order to find knocking point, you can fiddle around with a bow vise and some bubble levels. I have them and I never use them. I use a T-square. This is from Easton. I'll have a link in the description below. But you can use the L-square. You can use any of these type of square. But of course, these just knock right onto the string. So as you can see here, I have the bottom edge here of the T-square lined up right there above the soft knot inside my D-loop. And it is covering up the burger hole exactly the way I want it to be. That's how you find your knocking point. To further add to this point, mentally, this only really 
works with a binary cam system where both the top and bottom cam are the exact same. So what about like Hoyt's cam and a half system that they used for absolute decades? What about PSE's different cam systems that they use for absolute decades? What about here on this Elite Cure? This is a binary cam, but look, this cam here, shaped like this, notice it, versus the top cam here, which has that teardrop shape like a typical Elite cam has in the past. Where's the symmetrical point here? Mark off the axles. Again, if I mark off the axles, I didn't put a rubber band on this one. It comes right down here to the bottom leg of my D-loop. Again, a solid 3 eighths to a half inch too low, and that is atrociously low. So do yourself a favor, invest in the 10, 12 bucks, whatever it is for that Easton T-square, and you'll always be able to find a perfect knocking point in that perfect level each and every single time. Number five, and I probably am just as much to blame as every other guy on YouTube, but shimming cams. Shimming of cams is like the 10th thing down on the list when it comes to bow tuning of what you should resort to when you're getting a tear that you can't get rid of. Depending on the type of bow you have, you have yoke tuning, you have torque tuning with your grip, you have possible fletching clearance issues, you possibly, your rest is out of center shot, maybe you're shooting the wrong spine, maybe you're shooting under spine, over spine, maybe your cams are out of time. There are so many different things that could be going on with your bow long before you ever have to shim, and particularly the grip, and I harp so much on grip because it seems like it kind of gets tossed to the wayside for other tuning methods, but your grip has 99% to do with your tuning because if you are not repeatable and you are not doing the right thing every time your bow is going to react it only knows to do one thing rotate the cam send the arrow down range and if you're pushing differently it's going to go okay we're getting pushed this way today and it's going to force the arrow in a different flexing pattern you're going to get different tears so if you're getting a consistent tear that doesn't change, then you probably have a fletching contact issue or you have some other type of contact issue or your cams are out of time and you can't overdo it out of tune bow. You just can't do it. If you've exhausted every option, like no matter how much pressure you put into the grip one way or the other, you've tried a litany of different arrows, underspined, overspined, you've tried different rests, you've tried moving your rest way out or way in, so on and so forth, and you still can't get it, then you can go ahead and start shimming. Shimming is not a very easy process for you at home or the bow shop. And I get a lot of people that say, my bow shop doesn't want to shim. I'm like, yeah, I kind of agree with your bow shop. It's like the last thing on the list that they want you to try. Now, they're probably not going to tell you to try all the things that I just suggested. And if you want a full list of things that I just suggested, please, again, Facebook, Instagram, email, averagecharger, gmail.com. I'll be happy to troubleshoot anything and everything with you. I live for this kind of stuff. But it's down on the list. It's so far down the list for that bow shop, and it takes hours and hours of work. And in the end, if you're still screwing around with your grip, it still might not fix your problem. So if you are able to go to the bow shop and say, and bring your sheet of paper and say, listen, I tried this, 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 this. Here I tried a different grip. Here I tried a 400 grain point on a uh, 500 spine arrow still didn't work or vice versa 100 grains out of a 200 spine arrow still didn't work then they're able to say okay you got us we'll help you shim the bow that's the only way to really get it done if you really want to do it yourself and have the press and everything go for broke but your bow shop's not going to do it because they know what i know at least the guys that have been around a long enough time know that there's about 15 different things that you at home need to try first before they start swapping shims and doing all that sort of stuff. Now certain bows like Matthews with the top hat system, that's a lot simpler. That's just putting a bow in a press, pulling out the little screws, popping out the axles, super easy, flipping the top hats around. But if you got a Hoyt, Elite, a PSC, a Prime, or anything like that where you do have actual shims, you got to pop the axle out, pull the whole cam, and then fiddle fart around these little shims that's a lot of work and it's very time consuming matthews guys have it pretty simple uh, but for the rest of the bow industry if you want it shimmed expect to do the other things on the list long before you get to that point all right so i hope that helps lead people down the right path of tuning what steps they should take to start and to end and hopefully avoid some of these absolutely massive speed bumps along the way but if you feel like i still left you with questions or you have just other questions that don't pertain to these five things once again please follow links in the description below hit me up on facebook and instagram average jack archery send me an email average jack archery at gmail.com or leave a comment here on YouTube. I get back to everybody here on YouTube that has a pertinent question. If I can read it, I'm going to respond to it. I love, absolutely love doing this stuff for folks. So that's all for this video. I hope you're able to get outside, enjoy the sport of archery, archery hunting if you so choose. Definitely enjoy God's beautiful creation. 
and we'll get to see you next time.